Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing. And today we're going to look at a company on the opposite end of the spectrum from Google. We're going to take a look at a relatively small company called Quarter Hill. Um, I think this stock's really interesting because, well, number one, they have a large net cash, cash position of over $50 million. And that's almost a third of their market cap. Current market cap is about $150 million. Historically, this has been a, a pretty profitable business, although it can be volatile. And they do pay a 4% dividend yield. So interesting. Want to take a look. The company is actually expected to release its Q4 results later this week. So I thought it would be fun to get the video out ahead of the earnings. So we'll start with a little description of who they are and what they do. And I'll just jump into the annual report for this. But Quarter Hill was previously known as YLAN, and they engage in IP licensing or more commonly known as their patent trolls. So they have a portfolio of patents and uh, they ensure uh, they go out and see which companies and often large technology companies, Samsung, Apple, to name a few, are actually using their IP without paying for it. And then they try and pursue uh, some sort of a licensing deal. And if that fails, then they'll take legal action. And so uh, historically that was the business, Pure Play. In 2017, uh, the company made a move to uh, diversify outside of that business. And some of the recent court rulings in the States have made it a lot more difficult for pure play uh, patent trolls, uh, becoming a little bit more of a challenging environment. And so YLAN rebranded itself as Quarter Hill. Uh, they announced a couple of acquisitions and they bought uh, two companies, Visaya, uh, which provides enterprise asset management software, and IRD, which is automated traffic collection data. So two tech technology businesses that are EBITDA positive. Uh, they paid $26 million for Visaya and they paid about $48 million for IRD. They also hired a new CEO, uh, Doug Parker, and he started with the, in the business January 2018, and he comes with a large, uh, extensive background in M&A, which essentially is their new strategy to take the cash generated from the uh, licensing business and put it to work by acquiring technology companies. So he was the former head of M&A for OpenText. Important to note, he's been with the business for a little over a year and actually hasn't completed an acquisition yet. So it does seem like he's taking his time. We know that valuations are are rich in the tech space, so I don't necessarily view that as a as a bad thing. I think he's taking his time and makes sure he finds a uh, a good deal. Last thing I'll I'll touch on here, just in the annual report, they do describe, and by no means am I a patent expert. Uh, but they do describe some of the areas that Wyland's patent portfolios, uh, some of the areas in which they hold uh, IP. Uh, and I won't get into all of it here, but you can see it a little bit on, on the screen. And that in general is the business. So for many years was, was just the IP licensing side. And then really over the last 12 to 18 months, they've made this pivot. Uh, they still have a large net cash position. Um, and I think that provides a pretty good backdrop for the video. So here's the five-year trading history for the stock and obviously not a great story for investors. You can see back in 2015, stock traded a little over $4 a share. Currently, it's trading at $1.32. Uh, so it hasn't been a great story for investors. You can see some volatility in their results as the, the business, uh, particularly the, the licensing business, can be quite volatile quarter to quarter. Uh, but overall, um, this is a this is a stock that's lost trajectory. They currently do pay a four percent dividend yield, and what's really interesting about this story and one of the reasons why I wanted to to look into it more closely is actually if you look at it from a valuation perspective, the last three years of EBITDA, uh, 2015, 16, and 17, the average EBITDA for the business is about 60 million, and that. The implied valuation there is less than two times EV to EBITDA, which is extremely low. Um, so extremely cheap from a valuation perspective. But as we move into the, the next part of the video, we'll look at some of the reasons why that might be the case. So 
let's just jump right into it. We'll talk about, we'll go through the financial overview as, as we usually do. We'll talk about some of the recent news and results, and then we'll conclude with some key considerations for the stock. So we'll start out in the annual report and on page 69, let's try that again. There, page 69, they do lay out some of the key financial highlights for the last couple of years. <clears throat> so a couple of points that I wanna make here. Uh, they have in 2017, as we talked about, acquired additional businesses uh, that do provide recurring revenue, some systems revenue, and some services revenue, but the majority of the business results and revenues are still shown in on the license side. So what was YLAN of old is still the by far the major contributor to the business. 101 million of revenue in 2017. And you can see going back in 2016 and 15, uh, it does provide some recurring revenue as well for the licensing deals that they have. But it is uh, still the vast majority of the results are dependent on the licensing uh, revenue. Second key thing I wanna point out are fixed costs. So if you look uh, down below here, We've got uh, all of the operating expenses laid out and they have 85 million in gross margin and they get down to just a $10 million uh, earnings, earnings before tax number. And that has to do with all the fixed costs that they, they have in the business. I will note that there's uh, some non-cash items here, amortization of intangibles, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but there's meaningful fixed costs in the business that they need to um, that they need to cover. And the other question that I'd have for for management here is on the actual direct costs. They show about 30 million a year in cost of revenues for the licensing business. And I'd be curious to know how much of that. I assume it's mostly employees or lawyers that they have on staff to help them uh, work their cases. I'd be curious to know how much of that is actually variable cost or is the majority of it fixed? And my assumption would be it's mostly fixed, uh, which would just be layer in another uh, fixed cost to the business that needs to be covered. And again, when you look at the annual results, it doesn't seem uh, volatile, but when we get into the year-to-date results, you'll see that from quarter to quarter, uh, the results can be quite, uh, can be quite volatile. And so I also want to talk about amortization of intangibles. And as you can see here, it's about between 25 and 35 million per year. Obviously, this is a real cost. If you've got a portfolio of patents, um, even though it's non-cash in nature, you know, over time, that portfolio of patents is going to lose value, presumably. One thing to note, and I won't take you to the cash flow statement right now, but over the last few years, uh, they haven't been investing in acquiring new patents to equal the depreciation or amortization amount. So I think in 2016, they acquired $10 million worth of intangibles. And in 2017, there was none. And that compares to about 25 to 35 of amortization over time. So something to think about, it's a true cost of the business, but it is, it is non-cash. So with that, why don't we look at EBITDA generated by the business? And they do break that out on page 73. I believe here we go. So you have a really nice picture of, of EBITDA, especially when you look at it on an annual basis, 58 million of EBITDA in 2015, uh, 54 million in 2016 and 64 or 65 million in 2017. And we have to remember that the market cap of this business is, is 150 million and they've got 50 million of net cash. So an enterprise value of $100 million for what looks to be, you know, 60, 60 million of EBITDA um, with a business with zero debt. So uh, pretty compelling valuation. We'll see in our, our results here to date that uh, it can be lumpy and 2018 results haven't been great so far. That's the EBITDA picture. I uh, 
do want to quickly show it by segment if I can. Let's see here, I think 79. Here we go. So again, same story on the revenue side. If you look at the EBITDA by segment, uh, technology or, or YLAN is pretty much all of the EBITDA. Uh, so the two acquisitions they made, they are EBITDA positive, but not really moving the needle. In fact, both of them together really just cover the, the corporate overhead costs. Uh, so I wanted to throw that in there. And then the last thing that I'll point out is, and we've talked about it before, is just the strong balance sheet at the bottom of the page here. So you can see at the end of each year, um, they had over 100 million of cash at the end of 2016. At the end of 2017, they had 82 million of cash. Um, really no long-term debt. Uh, they've taken on a little bit year to date, uh, but still very much in that cash position uh, for the business. So that's the financial overview. Let's talk about uh, recent results uh, for the business. And the first thing I want to do is uh, show a press release that they came up with in January. So they're currently involved in, uh, in potential litigation with Apple on two of their YLAN patents. Initially, or late last year, I believe, uh, there was an initial verdict yeah, in August 2018, uh, the jury awarded Wyland $145 million in damages against Apple. So again, think about a business with $150 million market cap. Uh, this is a huge verdict. In, in January, we had an update that the court did not lower the damages award, but did grant Wyland the option to accept either reduced damages in the amount of $10 million or a new trial limited to determine the amount of damages only. So my understanding of that, or the way that I think about it is the settlement is ultimately going to be somewhere between 10 and 145 million. Now, small potatoes for a company like Apple, but huge uh, catalyst for the stock for Quarter Hill, depending on where that, where that lands. Uh, so that's the, the most meaningful uh, recent update. And then let's talk a little bit about the Year-to-date results, again, uh, the company is expected to release their Q4 numbers uh, later this week, but we do have access to the Q3 uh, results. I'm in the MDNA uh, from their website. And the first and most obvious thing that I want to point out, and after we saw those really nice three years in a row of, of EBITDA, you can see that in the nine months year-to-date, uh, revenue has fallen off a cliff, particularly on the license side. So um, from 91 million in the nine month period in 2017, the licensed business has only produced 13 million year to date. And that is driving uh, a negative $30 million loss, you can see here. So the business, while it has historically been profitable, has had a couple of really poor quarters. Uh, and Management has always guided investors to this, to understand that this business should not really be looked at from a quarter to quarter basis. That this lumpiness is always inherent from time to time. And when they have these major settlements like could potentially be with Apple, those will show up in, in a given quarter, uh, but it's something that they've been working towards for uh, a significant period of time. So it's a tricky, tricky business to analyze from that perspective. But one thing to note, obviously is they're not having a great year uh, financially. And we know that uh, in Q4, there's Q4 is over. I mean, uh, December 31st has passed. So there weren't really any significant press releases that would suggest that their Q4 numbers will come in much better. So I think it's fair to assume that when the Q4 results come in, uh, that, that 2018 is, is gonna be a year of weak financial performance for, for Quarter Hill. Now, on the flip side, you do see some of the other businesses starting to contribute more meaningful as they've got a full year of, of revenue. Um, and you can see some nice growth here in the system services and recurring side of the business. I'll also show you quickly just on the segmented side. Uh, let's see, page 14. There we go. 
So again, the business for the nine months generated negative 14 million of EBITDA. And again, the majority of that is driven by the technology side or YLAN or the patent portfolio. You can see the mobility and factory businesses that they've acquired are positive EBITDA, but again, even in this case, not even offsetting the corporate allocation. So the patent for the short term is going to be the big driver of the financial results of the business. And I think, yeah, there was one other point that I wanted to make and it, and it just related to thinking about their strategy now of going out and taking their cash and acquiring businesses. If you look at what they paid for those two major acquisitions, I mean, they paid about $80 million for, for both of those. And if we look at the EBITDA contribution, two plus two, you've got four over nine months. Even if you assume that comes in at 6 million for the year, um, those aren't cheap acquisitions. Those are quite rich from a valuation perspective. So if you think about the amount of cash that they'll need to generate to, to buy EBITDA in these other segments, it's gonna take some time. So that was really all I wanted to run through on the recent results. And why don't we jump into some key considerations for the stock? So what do we know about Quarter Hill? Strengths, they've got a broad patent portfolio and they do have a track record of litigation success. I think if you look back over the last several years, 2018 possibly excluded, um, they've got a track record of monetizing the value of that patent portfolio. So I think it's fair to believe that they've got the, a team in place that, that can successfully extract value from it. Valuation is extremely compelling. And again, for me, one of the key reasons why I wanted to take a look at the stock. If you look at those 2017, 16 and 15 results, the business right now is trading at less than two times that historical EBITDA. And, uh, has no debt. So we got a strong balance sheet here with 50 million of net cash. Now, the counter to that is the fact that year to date, uh, the business has been EBITDA negative, um, given how lumpy the business is and how poor the results have been on the patent side. So maybe EBITDA comes in close to that negative 20 mark, in which case this, this valuation discussion, I mean, that's the give and take here. And we'll get into that in our bull basin uh, uh, bear case scenarios. But Coming back to the strengths, we've got a strong balance sheet again, uh, net cash of 50 million and a 4% dividend yield while you, while you wait. Uh, so um, you're getting paid to be patient here if you think that this is an attractive opportunity. Risks, one of the things that we didn't, we didn't touch on it in terms of looking at the source documents, but I did take a look and there's no meaningful insider ownership here, which um, I'd flag as a, as a key risk, particularly for a story like this where, um, Capital allocation is going to be a huge uh, driver of results. Business has net cash. Uh, what would I really want to see? I'd want to see a CEO or a C-suite and people on the board that have a, a real vested interest um, in insider ownership. And, and there really isn't much here. So just something to be aware of. Another key risk, eroding value of the legacy patent portfolio. This, for me anyway, is very tough to value. Um, it's tough to know exactly how much more they'll be able to extract from their, their patent portfolio. I mean, by all intents and purposes, it's a going concern and they continue to add and grow to it where possible. But we do know that they made this strategic shift back in 2017. They're going to know the portfolio better than, than any of us. Are, are they making that shift because some of the recent decisions from the U.S. courts suggest that it'll be tougher to be a pure play sort of patent troll business model, or are they making a shift because they can sort of see the cliff out a couple of years where uh, their portfolio of patents isn't going to be as valuable as it as it was in the past? And the third is the the lumpiness of the business model and the potential for losses. And there's no question that we're seeing that in in 2018. Key drivers for the stock the Apple litigation outcome. I mean, this, you know, if they get a verdict at the high end of the range, that, that could represent the entire market cap of the stock. Uh, licensing division success, again, we, we walked through it in the financial results, but for, for now anyway, 
the key driver of the financial performance is going to be the licensing division. So um, the the acquisitions that they've made could prove to be very successful over time, and they may, may be able to build and grow on that. But as it stands right now, uh, the licensing uh, division is still the gorilla in the room. And third, the ability to find attractive acquisitions. It's it's tough out there, and maybe one of the reasons why the new CEO has has not uh, made a splash in in over a year with the business, being careful not to over overpay, being careful to find the right opportunity. We know that there's lots of liquidity out there, and the types of businesses that they're looking to acquire um, are often being sold for extremely rich valuation multiples. So those are the key considerations. And let's talk a little bit uh, about the bull, the base, and the bear case scenarios. And again, these are just illustrative, just to get a sense for you know what the stock could do in certain scenarios. But here's here's a couple of ways that I that I looked at this story. So if we if we start with the bull scenario, let's go right to the top end of the range. Let's assume that they're able to get the maximum. This 145 million dollar Apple settlement would be huge for for Quarter Hill, given the size of the business. Let's also assume that the licensing business produces an average of 50 million of EBITDA per year. You know, that 2018 was more the exception um, with the Apple settlement and they come back and over the next three to five years, the licensing business is still gonna churn out an average of, of 50 million. And the cash that they receive from the Apple settlement and the net cash that they currently have are reinvested, you know, the CEO is able to find attractive acquisition opportunities. They're able to invest in more of the recurring revenue type tech businesses. And that EBITDA, that segment grows to about 20 million. So from the additional acquisitions that they made, plus the growth of the ones that they've, they've already uh, completed. So if we look at that, and, and obviously both of these business seg segments are gonna have extremely different valuation metrics. But if we look at a four times EBITDA value on the licensing side and 15 times on the recurring side, um, that's going to work out to an implied share price of $4.80. So that's 260% from where it currently trades. So you can see in a bull scenario um, that it, this could be very attractive for shareholders. Yeah. Now, how much risk is involved in, in getting to uh, that bull scenario? Well, that's you know up to each investor to determine. Base case, uh, 75 million Apple settlement. I really just kind of cut it in the middle uh, because I have no no other way to really go about it. Don't have any inside information here. Uh, licensing business produces an average of 30 million of EBITDA. So I sort of cut it in half and said, you know, historically it's done about 60. 2018, it's going to lose EBITDA. Uh, it's going to be EBITDA negative. But let's assume that it can sort of generate 30 million in EBITDA. The recurring side of, of uh, again, the recurring tech segment, EBITDA, put that at 15 million. They're not going to have as much additional cash to for, for additional acquisitions um, and uh, maybe not quite as much growth. I've kept the same valuation metrics um, and that works out to an implied share price of $2.90 a share. So 120% upside from where it is today. The bear side let's assume that they only get 10 million on the apple settlement so really um, it would be a very poor result for them and let's also assume that the licensing business is sunsetting and you know i think you could probably go more negative on the bear side here i am not an expert it's really tough to to value this business and that's probably one of the the, the key issues with the story it's tough for investors to sort of wrap their heads around it but for the bear side, I've assumed that there's still some value there, that they're able to extract an average of 10 million of EBITDA for the business. And the recurring tech segment, uh, I've, I've put additional acquisitions on here, but I, I meant to not. Uh, really in this side, they, they're not going to have much additional cash to put to work because they didn't get much from the Apple settlement. And they do need to keep some cash on hand to weather through some of these money losing quarters that they're going to have. So. Um, that's a bit of a typo on, on my part, take that part out. And really you just see uh, that piece grow quite a bit more slowly. And if you put the same valuation metrics on, uh, that works out to an implied share price of $1.60 per 
per share. And, and that's still 20% upside from where it trades today. Again, you could easily come up with a bear case that is, uh, that is materially worse than this. This is, we have to remember that Quarter Hill in 2018 is most likely going to lose or show negative EBITDA, 15 to $20 million. So uh, these numbers on, on the bear side do require uh, the business to bounce back from a pretty poor 2018. So that's a, an important disclaimer there. Uh, and that's it. That's it for the video. Um, let me know what you think. Which scenario is most likely? Am I crazy on the bear side? Maybe I'm being a bit too optimistic. Have I missed anything? Or do you have a different take? Uh, that's a wrap. Check us out at ostrichinvesting.com or on Twitter at ostrich underscore invest. And we'll be back soon with more content. But until then, happy investing and don't bury your